Amen. Thanks, Brother Garrett. Um, first off, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to preach. I appreciate it. I was talking with my wife when we were coming back from soul winning. I think the last time I was set to preach was actually July 10th, and that was the day my wife went into labor with baby John. So it's been, a, it's been a, quite the journey, and it's nice to be back here. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, again, thank you for everybody's prayers. It's so great to have them here and healthy. And uh, we attribute a lot of that to the prayers and the support of this church and others. So uh, we're there in uh, Psalms 103, really good psalm. Um, I think sometimes we can overlook the psalms and the stuff that the, the meat and the good doctrines that are in there. Um, for introduction, let's start in verse 8. Uh, Psalm 103 and verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. That's a great promise. That's, uh, you know... Especially uh, a topic that's been discussed here with the whole flat earthers. You know, that's a, that's a finite distance if somebody believes the fat, flat earth theory. Thank goodness that we believe that, uh, you know, we know that the earth is round and that's an infinite distance. The east never touches the west. So if we're saved, that promise is for us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Verse 14, this is kind of what I want to focus on. For he knoweth our frame, he, rem he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. The Bible says he knoweth our frame. God knows our frame. He knows what we're made of. You know, you see all these houses built, all these buildings are built. Most of them all are built the same way. There's some brick, but most of the time it's, it's framed, two by four studs framed. That's what they're made of. All the other stuff on the outside, it's, it's extra, it's, it's above that. But he knows what we're made of, too. He knows our frame. He knows that we're just dust. Um, and kind of what I want to touch on with this is the pride to humility spectrum. Um, the Bible talks a lot about pride. You can't hardly read a, book of, uh, a chapter of the book of Proverbs without coming across something on pride. If you would turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 16. God knows our frame. He knows what we're made of. He, he remembers that we are dust. You know, our life is but a vapor. Our life is fragile. Uh, we're here today, gone tomorrow. The Bible talks it about a vapor in the wind, uh, water spilt on the ground. And that is one aspect of it, but I, I want to focus on the aspect of the humility of our lives, understanding our place and, and uh, the correct humility for our lives, right? If pride is a spectrum, you have pride on one side. If you're there in Proverbs 16, verse 5, this is what God thinks of a proud heart. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. We want, the Bible is very clear that we want to try and avoid pride in our life. Pride leads us to destruction. Pride leads us to a haughty mind and boasting and, and so forth. We want to avoid pride at all costs. Proverbs 3 and 34 says, Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Right? The, the humble in spirit, the humble in heart, uh, is, is what the Bible tells us we should be, how we should be. Um, but I think sometimes, and, and don't misunderstand my point, I'm not trying to push anybody towards the pride spectrum, but I think sometimes we in our lives, we can um, overshoot on, on the, in an, an earnest way to try and avoid pride in our lives. We can overshoot humility to the point where we're self-defeating, where we're, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I can't do anything, I'm, I'm worthless for the kingdom, I'm not worthy to do anything, right? Why should I be knocking somebody's door? Why should I be bugging them? Why should I be... Who am I that I should do this? Uh, and that's kind of the point I want to talk about, is, is finding that true humility. Avoiding pride, finding humility, but not pushing yourself too far on that, on that spectrum. 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, if you would turn there, please. 1 Peter chapter 5. We want to be humble. We want to have a humble heart and, and a receptive heart, but we also want to remember uh, who we are and what, what uh, needs to be done. 1 Peter 5, if you're there in verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. We need to humble ourselves under His hand, under His law, under His rule, under what the Bible tells us. Verse 7, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. This chapter is, is geared to pastors and people at church. Uh, so this is talking to the saved, for He careth for you. And I, I want to make it a point, too, that we know that He cares for the unsaved. Right? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, every single person. He had loved at one point. He, he wants us to reach the gospel to everybody. That's why we go, that's why it's important that we're part of a church that actually goes soul winning. 
Mark 6 and verse 34, it says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Jesus had compassion on the lost. Would to God that we had that same compassion when we go knocking doors. It can get to a routine where we have the script that we say, and hi, you know, we're from such and such. And it can kind of get uh, monotonous because we do it so often. But let's make sure we have tender hearts and, and understand that for he careth for you, talking about to a church to save people, but also he cares for the lost. Jesus has a heart for the lost. Let's us have a heart for the lost as well. He careth for you. I want to talk about that with the unsaved, but I also want to focus mainly this night, this evening, on God careth for you as a saved individual. Uh, if you would, turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Um, kind of on the spectrum of, of pride and humility and not overshooting it, making sure that we understand that we have a job to do. Uh, sometimes we can, we can get down on ourselves or we can get um, maybe to the point where, again, we're like self-defeating, we're our own worst enemy, we're uh, discounting what our capabilities are, or what our, our level of importance is. Exodus chapter 3, this is uh, Moses in the burning bush, if you're familiar with the story. Uh, Moses uh, was born in Egypt, uh, he, he grew up in Pharaoh's household, his mother nursed him for the first few years, and then he grew up in Pharaoh's household, uh, and then when he was old, he actually comes back to, to Egypt to do a great thing, which is as a side note that uh, we ought not discount the importance of a mother in the early formative years of her child. You know, Moses was only spent two to three years with his mom. This isn't the point of the sermon, but I think it's worth noting. He only spent two to three years with his mother, but those years that he spent brought him back when he was older, right? The Bible has that promise, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's, we, can, we can cling to that promise, and we see that in Moses' life. But anyway, so Moses, he grew up in Egypt. Uh, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his fellow uh, brothers. And he killed the man, he fled, he went into the desert, and he got married, had a family, and he's raising the flock of his father-in-law. And he sees this bush that's burning and it's not consumed, so he goes to check it out. Um, we'll pick up the story in verse 9. It's God speaking to Moses out of the bush. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God tells Moses, I've got a job for you, Moses. You're going to, go to, you're going to go to Pharaoh, and you're going to bring my people out of Egypt. This is a couple hundred thousand people. This is a big job. And I, I like Moses' response here, because sometimes I've had this, and I'm sure other people have had this as well. We think what Moses says here. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? Who am I? I'm just a regular guy. I'm not anybody special. I'm just, it's just me. It's just me. We know our own faults. We know our shortcomings. We know the things we struggle with. Who am I to go tell somebody the good news? Who am I, I, who, am I worthy to be able to open the Bible to somebody and explain it to somebody? Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children out of Egypt? Uh, hold your place there in Exodus chapter 3. If you would, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Again, sometimes we can get this thought in our mind and I think, you know, the Bible tells us that Moses was more meek than any man on the earth when he lived. So he was a very meek and humble guy. And maybe this question that he asked was from a place that we can find ourselves in too, where we're trying to avoid pride and trying to aim for humility, but maybe we overshoot it a little bit. Maybe we get to the area where we're questioning ourselves. Or, uh, and I'm not talking about being puffed up or having self-esteem. Don't, don't misunderstand me here. But who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? What, what, what do I have to do with this? John chapter 1 and verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you're saved this evening, if you've got the Holy Spirit living within you, you are a child of God. You are worth, God, God has a plan for you. We're not worthless, we're not uh, unable to do anything for the kingdom. God has a plan for us, and we're children of the Most High God. That's who we are. Who am I, says Moses? Well, God's got a plan for him. God's got something for him to do. Flip back to Exodus chapter 3, if you kept your place there. God says, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. God's not going to leave him alone. God's not going to have him go off on his own. I will be with thee, God says. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Now, Moses still kind of has this mindset. If you'll flip over to Exodus chapter 4, just a page or two in your Bible. He still has questions. He still has doubts. He still has uh, concerns. Uh, it says in verse 10 of Exodus chapter 4, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, 
neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses is still having reservations. And God, you know, oh, I, I can't speak well. I don't know what to say. God says, I made your mouth. I'm going to teach you what you should say. Look at verse 12. Now therefore go, that's a direct command, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. We can be confident when we go soul winning, when we go to preach the gospel, when we set standards in our family, when we uh, make it a point to anything that people question, people that aren't outside, that maybe don't understand or don't read the Bible, anything that people question, we can be confident in our decisions if they're based on what the Bible teaches. Proverbs, if you would turn to Psalm chapter 31. Proverbs 3 and 26, I'll read for you. It says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. We're supposed to have confidence, not in ourselves, not in our own abilities, not in our pride or being boastful. With, you, with a humble heart, we're supposed to have confidence in the Lord and what the Bible teaches we should do. Psalm 31 and verse 17 is a very neat psalm. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. I'm saved. If you're saved, if you've called upon the name of the Lord, let me not be ashamed, he says. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Sometimes it's hard, you know, if, you, if you're, especially if somebody's not plugged into a church and they're trying to do what the Bible says in their lives. Maybe they're trying to homeschool their kids and they don't have anybody, they don't have a community to homeschool with. If they're trying to, home, uh, if they're trying to go soul winning. And if you don't have a church that's sending you out soul winning, many of us have gone a couple times on our own and you just, it's, it's difficult to make that a habit that you stick to because you're out there by yourself doing it. How shall they go except they be sent, it says in Romans chapter 10. If you're that lone rock standing in the current of the river, the current of the world, and you're trying to stand out like a sore thumb and you're all by yourself, that's a tough thing. If you're standing with a group of people, a church, and you're, you're all pulling together in the same direction, you're fighting that same fight together, you're surrounding yourself with like-minded believers, and you're, you're gaining strength and power from that through what the Bible says and through applying it to your lives, let me not be ashamed. Let's not be ashamed of the things that we're doing that are based on what the Bible teaches. Let the world be ashamed. Let, let them that are sending their kids off to daycare, let them that are not, not following what the Bible teaches, let them be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Romans 1 and verse 16. Again, we can have confidence when we go out soul winning, when we base our decisions, how we live our lives, on what the Bible says. Romans 1 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Sometimes, sometimes uh, again, if we're out soul winning, or if we're making decisions on our Christian life, or if we're in situations where uh, you know, we're with family members or with other people that are, that are not doing things the same way we're doing. It, we can have this small voice of doubt that creeps in the back of our head. You know, is it, is, it, is it really worth me bugging these guys on a Sunday afternoon to try and give them the gospel? Because most people don't. Most people aren't interested in what, what we're trying to show them from the Bible. We hear, we hear the door get shut a lot. No, thank you. No, I'm not interested. Every once in a while, there's a, there's a screamer that comes out against you, like last week. You know, there's an, there's an, it's easy to have that small voice in the back of our mind say, you know, is it really worth it? Is it important what we're doing? Is it making a difference to what we're doing? Is it really that big of a deal if I go see a movie? Is it really that big of a deal if I don't follow this standard or if I take that drink or if I, whatever, whatever that small voice is telling you? That small voice is not the voice of God Almighty. That small voice is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that voice is not the voice of the Word of God. What is the first thing that Satan said when he was in the garden? The first thing that God records that he said, Yea, hath God said. He's casting doubt on what the Bible says. So if that small voice that you hear, if that, that temptation or that doubt in your mind is going against what the Bible says, that's not the voice of God. That's not the voice we should be listening to. We should have confidence and we should not be ashamed. Let, let, the, let the wicked be ashamed, the Bible says. Uh, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Luke chapter 4 and 36 kind of highlights this power and authority. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with, power, with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. This is the authority and power that we have when we base our lives on the Bible. When we open the Bible to somebody at the door, when we teach them what it says, it's not our words, it's not our talk, it's not like Elo uh, Moses says, it's not our eloquence or our lack thereof that gets somebody saved. It's the word of God. I'm sure, I know I've been out soul winning with people that, you know, uh, either very experienced or unexperienced, and, and they're mumbling on, I'm sure I've done it myself, where you're, you're jabbering on with somebody and you're 
you're preaching the gospel to them and maybe it's been a long time and you're kind of rusty and you're going all over the place and as a silent partner, I remember hearing one time, and it's like, oh man, I can't even follow this. But yet the guy gets saved. And it's, it's not our words that help people to get saved. It's us going out and telling what the Bible says. The Bible is what has the power and the authority, not our words. So, who am I? We're children of God. If you're saved tonight, you're, you're a child of God. God has a plan for our lives. What is God's plan? If you're there in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, look down at verse 10. Uh, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Don't, don't be confused, that dispensation, that's just talking about, if you think of like a soap dispenser, it's dispensing soap. If you think of time as, instead of soap, it's dispensing time. So in the dispensation of the fullness of times, like at the end of the world, at the end of time, is what this is talking about. Uh, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom, in Christ, in whom we have all, uh, excuse me, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. This, that's kind of a mouthful. Being predestinated. We have a predestinated plan. According to the purpose of him. Who is him? Of God. Who worketh all things together, all things after the counsel of his own will. We are predestinated according to God's purpose, is what that's saying that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So this verse, verse 11, being predestinated according to the purpose of God, this is talking to those about those who first trusted in Christ. If we've trusted in Christ, we're saved, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, God has a plan, he has predestinated us for his purpose. There was a, there was a man, uh, Kent Hovind, we were talking about him just the other day, and, and uh, he used to say, he had all these creation seminars, and he used to say in the seminars, you know, kind of alluding to the purpose of life. Everybody out there wants to know what the purpose of life is. You know, theologians and, and, and philosophers are always questioning and asking, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? Essentially, the purpose of life is there's two things. And Hoban kind of asked it in his question. He had it in his quirky way. He said, if you're not saved, I want to get you saved. And if you are saved, then what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? That was kind of his way. First, first thing, first purpose of life is to get saved. If you're not saved, you should get saved. Second purpose, once you're saved, you should do work for the kingdom of God. What are you doing on earth for heaven's sake? That was kind of his way, and it was a quirky way, but it, it makes sense. Ephesians chapter 2, if you want to flip over there from Ephesians chapter 1. We'll go over a verse that we all know well. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, and we'll add on number 10 as well. Ephesians 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by trusting only in what Christ did on the cross as full payment for our sins. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. We, as, as saved people, how we are saved, are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are saved to do good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God does, he saved us, and he saved us for a purpose. We have a purpose for others, to, to the sermon this morning. Our purpose is to help others, to help others get saved, uh, mainly to help spread the gospel. Uh, and it's interesting there, the King James Bible says that we should walk in them. One uh, important note, the New American Standard Bible, it's a very popular Bible, especially amongst like Calvinist-leaning churches. It says in verse 10, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Would implies that it is going to happen. This is where you get the if saved, always saved, or if you are saved, you will have the good works, which is a false gospel, that we should walk in them. We should get saved. God commands us, all the commandments of the Bible, all the Old Testament, New Testament laws, that we're not disannulled through you know, the meats, drinks, uh, cardinal ordinances, diverse washings. Those were postponed. But all the, how God feels about murder, how God feels about rape, how God feels about stealing, theft, adultery, whatever the things that God says, those commandments still are in place. They're still for us. We're still commanded that we should walk in those good works. God, you know, when somebody gets saved, I, I tell sometimes, I said, look, all these commandments, we should do them. God commands us to do them. He expects us to do them. They're not part of salvation. It's the next step, right? You get saved and then you want to follow Jesus. That's the next step. Get saved first, make your decision to follow Jesus. It's the next step. But God does expect us to do them. That's not 
would walk in them, that's should walk in them. So what works do we have to do in our life? What is God's plan for us? He has a plan for us that we get saved and that we follow the Bible. We do those good works like it talks about in Ephesians uh, 2 and 10. Well, the first works would be Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is, this is soul winning. This is reaching the lost. And there's multiple ways, obviously, to do this. We all have friends. We all have family members, you know, that we can share the gospel with. Not necessarily at a soul winning time, but soul winning is a great way to get plugged in, to have it as a routine part of your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If we don't follow these first works, if we don't go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, if we don't actively make it part of our routine, it's not going to affect us. We say that all the time, soul winning. I'm not coming out knocking on your door as part of me trying to get into heaven. It's just as our duty to follow what the Bible says. We should do it. We should walk therein. And if our gospel is hid, if we don't go out, it's hid to them that are lost. They're the ones that are going to suffer. The watchman from Ezekiel, right? If he, if he sees the sword coming and he just like, oh, I'm out of here, see you later, the whole town, that's the one that gets damaged. It's not him. He's out of there. His, he's, his neck is safe, right? But the people that lost are the ones that would suffer. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a page over. And all things are of God, verse 18, excuse me. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's how we were saved. We, we had a debt to pay. We had sin that we had committed, and we deserved hell for that sin. But he has been, we have been reconciled to God by Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And hath given to us, the saved people, the ministry of reconciliation. So this is how we are, we are the ones responsible. You know, this, this, this question that Moses had. Who am I? Who am I that I should be out here bugging people on a Sunday afternoon? Who am I that I should be out here following what the Bible says and telling other people about it, and, you know, not in a contentious way, but in a confrontational way where you're approaching people and you're talking to people about it. Who am I that I should be doing that? Well, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. If we don't do it, people are going to suffer. People will die that would have gone to heaven. They, they will die and go to hell that would have gone to heaven if, they, if we had gone out. To wit, in verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We have the Bible, we have the power and authority of the Bible that we can help people get saved through that. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the only, God doesn't, when Jesus Christ was walking on this earth, he got people saved. But since then, people, other saved Christians, get other, saved, other people saved. Nobody gets, uh, you know, hit with a bolt of lightning and all of a sudden they're saved, right? It, it's somebody, somebody preaches the gospels to them. Somebody explains a verse or two to them. Somebody, you know, and it's, it could be a mini-step approach, right? Somebody gets one part and one part and one part and they get saved eventually. But it takes people, saved Christians, opening their mouth, and making known what the Bible says to get people saved. If we don't do that, nobody's going to get saved. Same with Apostle Paul, right? He was, he was on the road to Emmaus, and, and Christ kind of knocked him off his horse there and struck him blind. But then we saw on uh, Wednesday night when he went to Ananias, and Ananias was the one that told him, like, call in the name of the Lord. Like, he was the one that helped lead him to get saved. And so we have an important job to do. Sometimes we can think, oh, who am I? I'm nobody important. I'm just an average Joe. Like, we have our uh, insecurities. We have our, our mistakes are highlighted in our minds. Right? We play those on repeat all the time. Let's not get in our own way. Let's not be prideful. Don't, don't peg the needle on the pride spectrum. Let's stay humble, but let's not overshoot it and get to the point where we're taking ourselves out of the fight. Right? We have a job to do is save, save Christians. John 15 and verse 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There's this, there's this clear uh, uh, topic, or I forget what you want to say. I'm losing my word. But there's a, there's a clear theme in the Bible that we should be, as Christians, we should be fruitful. And I think one of the lies that the liberal churches do, that you know maybe they're safe people to go to these churches, that they do to kind of calm that, you know, because we have this urge. We, we know we should be fruitful. You can't help but read a couple chapters of the Gospels or a couple of the epistles and, 
and not see that we should be fruitful, we should be sharing, we should be witnessing, we should be, you know, soul winning. Um, the lie that they say is that being a fruitful Christian is done by exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Being fruitful is not exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Those are not the same thing. Exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit means that you're walking in the Spirit and that's the lifestyle of evangelism. And we should all have that. We should have, you should see a Christian who's saved and walking in the Spirit. You should see them have love in their life and joy in their life and be patient, long-suffering, be gentle, be meek, be te have temperance, and not, get, not fly off the handle so easily. But that is not being fruitful as a Christian. If you think of a, a tree, a tree that produces fruit, an apple tree produces apples. If you stick the apple in the ground and you plant it, it would become an apple tree. Reproduction, reproducing yourself is, is what it's talking about, about being fruitful. So if, if, as a Christian, you are not sharing the gospel with other people or you're not helping to further that, that is not being fruitful. You can walk in the fruit of the Spirit. That's a good thing, and we should do that. I'm not trying to discount that. But again, I think a lot of the liberal churches where saved people can be, they can comfort themselves and say, well, I'm checking the box. I'm being kind. I'm being you know, loving. I'm being joyful, and I'm being fruitful by doing that. Well, no, no, no. You're not being fruitful by doing that. You're exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, and that's good. But the first works is going to preach the gospel. That's the most important thing. Now, in this idea of being fruitful, in this idea with a tree, right? So if you imagine a tree, a tree is growing and it's producing fruit. Um, in order to help a tree produce more fruit, often, oftentimes you need to prune it. It'll shoot out all these wild branches and you'll end up with thousands of these little tiny fruit that aren't edible, they got huge seeds and, and it's, not, it's not training it in the right direction. Or it can be too big and too unwieldy and it'll literally break the tree. Uh, so you need to prune the fruit. God is the same way. When we're trying to bear fruit in our lives, if we're following what the Bible says, sometimes there's going to be things that the Bible teaches us that are going to be pruning in our lives. Proverbs 3 and verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as the Father, the Son, in whom he delighteth. God's correction, you know, and some of these things are going to be as far as, you know, maybe cleaning up our lives. You know, we get saved, we get baptized, you get into church, you start maybe going soul winning or walking around and you see a little bit of fruit. God might prune some things out of your life that can help you become more fruitful. Maybe it's worldly music. Maybe it's uh, worldly friends that are dragging you down. Maybe it's whatever it is, TV, different things that can pull our hearts away from what the Bible says. Sometimes those prunings can be a sharp pain, a quick, you know, it, it hurts to get a branch cut off. You know, you want to you have that branch, but sometimes we need to get pruned so that we can be more fruitful, more productive for the kingdom. Turn to Luke chapter 13. Another thing that you think of with uh, a fruit tree or a vine or something that's producing fruit, yes, you need to train it as far as pruning it, but sometimes you need to fertilize it. Luke chapter 13 and uh, verse 7, this is a parable. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? It's taken up space. There's no fruit. Cut it down. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after, and after that, thou shalt cut it down. Sometimes we need uh, a little bit of fertilizer in our lives, as far as our spiritual lives, to help us bear more fruit. A tree is the same way. If you don't fertilize it, if you don't prune it, it's not going to produce good fruit. It's not going to produce plentiful fruit. You know, it might make really tiny, small fruit. It's not going to be a good, healthy fruit tree. And our Christian lives, our spiritual lives are the same way. One thing with fertilizer, dung it, it says. Oftentimes, fertilizer is a little pungent. You know, sometimes when we hear preaching from the Bible, it might hit us in the face. It might, oh, you know, startle us a little bit. Sometimes it's not the most fun thing to hear, but it's, it's for the purpose of us producing more fruit. It's for the purpose of us getting more people saved. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We want, we want to be vessels that God can use to further his kingdom. And the, and the better we are... Uh, you know, the more productive of a fruit tree we are, if you will, you know, the more pruning has taken place, the more fertilizing has taken place, the more fruitful we can be as Christians. God has a plan for us. He wants us to do the works, the first works, and this is kind of talking about that. We want to be fruitful as Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? We are the vessel 
that the Holy Spirit will dwell in, right? We are that vessel that can go around and, and through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit within us, we can preach the gospel to other people. That's why we can have that boldness. James chapter 4 and verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse, ye hand, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James chapter 2 also says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So it's this pruning, this fertilizing in our Christian lives, this, this cutting sin out of our lives, this uh, adding you know, fertilizer to what the Bible says to help it grow, to help us grow strong, to help us take good, strong root to produce more fruit. These works, and us, you know, those are works, cleaning up our lives, getting baptized, reading our Bible, praying, these are works that we should do, but these works wrought with our faith, and those help make our faith more perfect, more complete, more whole stronger, bigger, so we can reach more people. Matthew 23 and 26, you know, God, God cares about everything. He gave us the Bible. He gave us rules for how we ought to look, how we ought to speak, how, the things we ought to watch, the things we not ought to watch, what we should do with our time. He told the kings to write them a copy of the book and read in it all the days of their lives. He told them, you know, it's, it's not for kings to, to have wine or strong drink. He, they gave us rules for our lives. He cares about every aspect of our lives. He's the God of detail. He's the God of order. He's the God of organization. Matthew 3, 23 and 26 says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. If we're vessels of the Holy Spirit, to be a better used vessel, we should be clean. Like the Bible says here, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter in our hearts. We need to have clean hearts. We need to have hearts that are receptive and humble to what the Bible teaches us, that the outside of them may be clean also. God also does care about how we look out the outside, how our, how our spirit is, uh, not just what our heart is. Yes, that's the more important, but He also cares about everything. So to be a, a, a useful vessel for the Holy Spirit and for this purpose, we need to focus on that as well. So God has a plan for our lives. We need to do the first works. We need to, it's up to us to help reach the gospel to everybody. Um, you know, we can get that small voice in our mind, who am I? What, what, what purpose do I have? Well, God has a lot of potential for us. Turn to um, Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. You know, what is the potential of our, of our Christian life? How, how, can we, how can we affect the world around us? Ezekiel 22 is a great uh, chapter on this. The pastor preached on it a few weeks ago. Uh, in verse 27, it says, Her princes... Ezekiel 22 and verse 27. Her princes, talking about political leaders, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood, to destroy souls, and to get dishonest gain. Boy, doesn't that sound like the United States today? To shed blood, to destroy souls. I saw we were driving um, on Highway 4 going through downtown Stockton. There was this big old billboard on the sign that says, Abortion will, is and will remain legal in California. We got you. We got you guys. There's the politicians to shed blood, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets, back to Ezekiel 22 and verse 28, and her prophets, the preachers, have daubed them with untempered moorings, mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when their Lord has spoke, had not spoken, and the people of the land had used oppression, and exercised robbery, and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. This is the state of this country at this time that Ezekiel is talking to. It doesn't sound a whole lot different than what the United States is today, right? We see a lot of these same things. And look at verse 30, what, what, what is said. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. He sought for a man. He didn't see, look for... 10,000 people. He didn't look for 300,000 people. He sought for a man, one person, to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge. One person, and I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them, and I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord. Sometimes our potential, who, who am I? Like, who is Moses? Moses asked that question. Who am I that I should go before Pharaoh? Moses didn't get started. He, it says in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 7 that he was fourscore years old when he stood before Pharaoh. He was 80 years old when he, when he stood before Pharaoh. So when he's in the burning bush, it could have been 80, maybe a couple years before he was 80. So 80, and he died when he was 120 years old, the Bible tells us. 
So the last third of Moses' life, he spent going to Pharaoh, doing what God told him to do, right? God said, go, therefore go and teach my people, get my people out of there. He spent the last third of his life, he got late start. You know, he was saved, I'm sure, when a young late, went from a younger age, but he, he got a late start serving the Lord. But you can make a very good argument that Moses was one of the most influential men in the Old Testament, and he spent the last third of his life serving the Lord, doing what God told him to do. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter where we are at in this life. It doesn't matter, you know, what our situation is. If you're saved and you have a heartbeat, you can do something to serve the kingdom of God, to, to help make a difference in future generations, right? We see this in Ezekiel 22, the state of the nation is such. And he was, he was seeking for one person, the difference that one person can make. Who, who am I? You know, I'm just an average Joe. I'm just, I'm just, you know, some guy that grew up somewhere and has a family. And, you know, everybody, everybody's an average Joe, right? Who am I? Well, who was Moses? He was the same boat, and he turned out to be one of the mighty men of God. He, he was there with Jesus in the, in the Mount of Transfiguration. There's good reason to believe that he's maybe one of the two witnesses in the end times. Who was who he? He was just an average guy that, got, that he, just in the last third of his life, decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what God wants with my life, and I'm going to follow what he tells me to do, and look what he accomplished. Colossians 4 and verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom towards them that are without to the unsaved and, and to, the, to the lost, redeeming the time. It doesn't matter when we start. It's, it's what we do with the time that we have left. Redeeming the time. The time is short. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Let's not, let's not forget the importance of one person. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that we should puff ourselves up, that we should aim towards pride at all. We want to keep that humble heart. But we want to make sure that we have proper humility. I heard it said once, and it, it, it matches what the Bible says, that true humility is thinking of yourself exactly as God sees you. No more and no less. We're all wicked sinners. We all have terrible pasts. Or, you know, we, we all have things that we, we know our own issues that we have. We know our own shortcomings. We know the things that we've made mistakes on and the issues that we've had. But if you're saved, you're a child of God, and, we've, and he's got a job for us to do. And so that's why it's important that we get part of a good church. We go to a church that's soul winning. We, we learn how to do that, and we, we try to make a difference. If we're following Jesus, look at Matthew 4 and verse 19. Every word of the King James Bible, we just had this with the NASB. No, every word of the King James Bible is pure words, the pure words of the Lord. We can trust every single word. Every single word is a promise. It says in Matthew 4 and verse 19, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This is a promise statement. If we are following Christ, He will make us fishers of men, soul winners, people that are getting other people saved, helping other people to get saved. When we get saved, the reason we don't just get raptured up to heaven right away is because we have a job to do on this earth. Let's not forget the job we have to do. We're saved to do works for God, to further His kingdom here on this earth. Right? We're saved to save the average Joe lost person. We're saved to save the person that we knock on the door with today. We're saved to save the the, the random person that we meet on the street, the, our coworker, our family member, our neighbor, our friends. We're saved to save the average Joe. But think about this. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Every single person, every single great person in the Bible that you read about was saved by somebody. Maybe the person that helped get them saved was the average Joe that got saved. We're saved to help find the Gideons and the Sauls, and, or the Pauls, and the James and the Peters and the Johns. We're saved to help find those people that are also going to do mighty works for the kingdom. Any preacher that we know that's, a, that's got great reach, pastor, other pastors that we know that pastors are friends with, they were saved by somebody, maybe at a young age, their family member, or, you know, they all have stories, oh, my grandparents got saved, and then we got plugged into a church, and then my parents got me saved at a young age. And look at the reach, you know, of, that, of their spread of the gospel. Our kids, we want to raise them up to where Pastor talked about this uh, a week ago, with, where we have a good testimony, that they have a good testimony, um, that they hopefully get saved at a young age and that they grow up in church and they grow up doing things for Christ. But we don't know what our kids are going to do or what our grandkids are going to do. or We don't know what we, can, what we can do. If we do like Moses and we just, okay, from this point on, I'm going to follow what God tells me to do, look what happened to Moses. Look what he accomplished. We could accomplish that too. Acts chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, uh, verse 1, excuse me. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and then Apollonia, they came into Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, 
as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath day reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Pastor touched on this the other week about Paul being constantly in soul winning mode. Paul, as his manner was, went in. He does this all the time, the Bible's saying right here. This is who he was. This was part of his spirit, his being, who he was as a person. We don't know when we knock on doors of people. You know, if you have kids, your kids hopefully are going to grow up in this and they're going to, um, you know, become great Christians and, and live a Christian life. If you don't have kids, there's, there's always people that we can reach in our community. When we go out soul winning, we don't know who we're going to talk to. We get somebody saved at the door, they could be the next Paul. Maybe their kid could be the next Paul. Maybe they're, you know, somebody like that. If we look at Paul, Paul never had any kids. But look at the impact that he made on the kingdom of God. To the Gentiles, he brought the whole gospel. I mean, the, the Bible has literally been to every single country. The gospel has been to every single country. All Gentile nations, non-Jewish nations, we attribute that to Paul. He was the one responsible for that, through the Holy Spirit, of course. But we don't know who the next Paul is going to be. We think of the nation, how it talked about in Ezekiel, where um, the princes were doing all these wicked things, uh, shedding blood, destroying souls, getting dishonest gain. The prophets are lying. The, the churches are lying to the people. We see that today. We're here, we're in churches like this. We find there are, other, there are other churches like this where there are so many people, there are so many churches that are preaching the right gospel, that are preaching the right word of God. What's it going to be 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 60 years from now, when our, when our kids, the next generation, and the next generation after that? Yeah, we should raise kids this way. We should raise kids in this manner. There's always been the remnant, right? The 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Who's that going to be in the next generation? If we don't have kids, if we don't have kids, that's fine, but make sure we're reaching our community so that we can teach other people, people that we knock on their door, the average Joe, that could be the next Gideon, that could be the next David, that could be the next Samuel. We don't know who we're going to reach, right? The next famous pastor, the next mighty man of God. So who am I? Moses asked that question. If you're saved tonight, you're a child of God with a responsibility, a responsibility to follow God, but a responsibility to others to reach them with the gospel, to reach them with the discipleship as well, right? Get them saved, uh, go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and commanding them everything. Uh, I messed that up, I'm sorry. And, and teaching them to observe all things. Preach the gospel, then people should get baptized, and people should discipleship. That's kind of the order, right, of getting people saved, getting people in church. There's a lot of lost souls out there. Fresno's a drop in the bucket, right? 500,000 people in Fresno. We're one church. There are not a whole lot of churches out there that are soul winning. So don't, don't in this pride spectrum, right? If you think of it, an analogy maybe to help you, you know, you, it's your gauge on the, on the dash of your car. You're driving your car. Sometimes you have the voltmeter on your dash, right? It shows your battery. When everything's working like it should, you should be at 14 volts. That's, your alternator's working good. Your electrical system's charging. You're doing good. If that's our point of true humbleness, humility, if, if things go over voltage and we're at 18 volts, things are going to pop. We're going to blow up the battery, fry the wiring, alternator's going out, something's going on. If, we, if we're hitting pride, that's not good. Things are going to destroy. We want to maintain humility, but we don't want to be low voltage either. We don't want to be our alternator's kicking out, our battery's going to be dead. Dead faith is good for nothing, right? It's, it's what profit it, does it have uh, from James chapter 2. We want to keep that true humility. Think of ourselves how God sees us, no more, no less. Um, let's remember that. We've got a great responsibility to do. Uh, let's go ahead and bow, in, uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer.